Lord God, we just say thank you first and foremost for uh, for what you're up to and for who you are. Thank you for being willing to stretch us, to challenge us, to put us in situations where we embrace what is uh, what is going on around us in meaningful and useful kinds of ways. I just say thank you first and foremost, Lord, for uh, for what uh, you're doing and what you're going to do through this conversation. Bless Gary. Give him clarity of communication. Give him clarity of conversation. Uh, bring his ideas into focus, not just in his mind, but in all of our minds. Thank you for uh, everything you're doing, Lord. All to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, it's good to be with good to be with everybody. You know, it's just uh it's really a privilege to to be with you uh uh you know over over the last few years we've done these webinars and I'm really excited about this new one. Now, a lot of this is uh, some some new material that I've been working on and uh and a lot of it it really deals with uh developing the the skills necessary to grow, you know, ministries and grow organizations. And and so we've called it the the sharper edge uh, leadership series, and our theme verse is, comes out of Ecclesiastes 10.10. 10. If the axe is dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed, but skill will bring success. And I'm sure all of us have um, you know, just wrestled over and over again um, with uh, not having the right tools in our hand or unsharpened tools. And, um, and you know, when we have the right tools and we have the tools that are uh, sharpened uh, to the right degree, then we can uh, get our jobs done a lot better. And so what we're talking about is sharpening the edges of our lives. And, uh, you know, and so we're going to look at uh, over this next, uh, this next season, we're going to look at three areas, uh, the leader's edge, your personal edge. And, and uh, today we're going to start off by talking about sharpening the ax, you know, your own personal development and what that means. But then we're also talking about your relationship with God and getting a harvest size vision and how do I listen to God? How do, how do I hear God's voice? How do I get his direction in my life? And then, and then the, the third one is on your communication of that vision and how do I cast the vision effectively? And, and so we're going to take a look at those things. And then, and then we'll move on to your team and how to sharpen your team's edge and, uh, and, and, and walk into those people you pull close to you. So those could be uh, volunteers, they could be elders, they could be staff, but whatever team you're gathering around you, how do you, how do you cultivate ownership? How do you equip them? How do you delegate, and delegate in a way that empowers them? How do you coach them? Uh, while they're in ministry, and uh, and then how do you how do you build a team? How do you create that community um, that's going to advance advance the cause? And then and then the organization's edge, whether this is a ministry or a church or an organization, uh, there are critical things that you need to you need to do to sharpen your organization's edge of effectiveness. And so um, that'll kind of give you a, give you a kind of an idea where we're going. Uh, in this uh, webinar webinar series, and so today we're going to be talking about you know your own personal development as a leader, sharpening the axe. You know, Abraham Lincoln has uh, noted it, the noted for saying, uh, "Give me six hours to chop down a tree, and I'll spend the first four sharpening an axe." And uh, the whole idea is having the right equipment um, and taking time and energy and focusing your energy in the, in the right directions. You know, really, it's not it's not always about working harder. A lot of times, it's working smarter. And so, we're going to talk about talk about a few of those things. Here are a couple uh, roadblocks. You know, that we talk about for personal development, or or in a sense, or we'd use the edge analogy. How how we lose our how we lose our edge. How does one lose their edge? And and there are four four areas. Just you know, spiritual apathy. You know, when we are just uh, not allowing the gospel to, to, to be formed in our lives and, and, and to uh, sanctify us and empower us and strengthen us, and, and we just get spiritually, spiritual apathy, and, uh, and, and that's a huge roadblock, you know. Uh, the second one is just emotional fatigue. You know, one of the things that, that we all struggle with is, is uh, you know we we who are in ministry. I mean, there there are not only spiritual challenges, but there are emotional challenges. And uh, as you carry 
you know, as you carry your organization, as you carry your team, uh, and you deal with all the dynamics of, of an organization, of a team, of a church, uh, there is a, there is an emotional fatigue that takes place. And, and, uh, and if we're not emotionally sharp and crisp in our lives and uh, emotionally aware, uh, we, can, we can really uh, drift into a, a deep set of fatigue, which could also lead into, lead into de- probably maybe depression. Relational clutter, you know, just I think it's another roadblock that that where we where we lose our lose our edge, and um, <clears throat> the, the whole idea of just not our relationships are not um, uh, that we don't hold short accounts. Uh, we uh, we've got some stuff building up, maybe attitudes or feelings towards people close to us on our team or or in our in our interpersonal lives. Um, and so just dealing with that, that stuff on an ongoing basis is, is really important. And then just leadership plateauing. You know, when we, we just, we just kind of, we get at a plateau. Uh, Robert Clinton says that every leader, every competent leader will wrestle through a, through a plateau. And, uh, because you just can't be continually growing and stretching all the time. And so there are going to be seasons. Uh, uh, where we plateau, but the, the the whole idea is we don't want to we don't want to settle in. <laughs> you know, we we want to get rest, but we don't want to settle into that plateau uh, and 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 be stuck. Uh, and then I think once we you know typically plateauing is going to lead to a decline, uh, decline in our skills um, and and uh, um, and in our leadership. And so those are the those are the four roadblocks um, that that we wrestle with. I just wonder if we could maybe in the chat room, if somebody, you know, if you want to throw in some, uh, what are some other roadblocks that uh, you wrestle with uh, in, in in the whole idea when you talk about the edge of your own personal leadership and personal growth? I'm watching the uh, the, the full chat area here, Gary. Uh, the question, if you want to enter in the lower left-hand corner in the chat area, is what are some of the personal roadblocks that you encounter? that get in the way of your development. So what are your roadblocks that get in the way? Busy schedule is the first one that popped up on my end, Gary. That one looked like that got sent to me. That's uh, that's just, that's that's related to emotional fatigue. Time management is the second one that came up. And okay. physical health has also come up a couple of times. Yeah, the whole, the whole idea of physical, I should have added that one in there, uh, the whole physical... Um, health because uh you know all these things are draining on our bodies and if our bodies aren't aren't clicking along well uh it really uh factors into uh, not a lot of these things so this is this is an interesting one as well this has come up a couple of times here uh the agendas that other people have for you and your leadership you know, that's okay. a, that that's a good challenge to uh, to wrestle through it seems like yeah yeah that's uh I think that would come under the relational clutter, you know. <laughs> For sure. You're dealing with other people there. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, it's, uh, we're going to keep uh, moving forward. And, and you know, the, those are the roadblocks that we all we all wrestle with. And, and so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about this, what I call this growth uh, uh, strategy. And uh, if we're going to really sharpen our axe and uh, take the time out, take that, you know, uh, Going back to the the Abraham Lincoln quote, you know, he said, "Give me six hours, you know, to chop down a tree. I'm gonna take four hours to sharpen an axe." And so, the the four hours of making sure uh, the tools are right, making sure you know your life is right. And so, we're gonna walk through this uh, little acronym here. And uh, you know, number one is just you know, it's being God centered and gospel gospel driven. You know, uh, Zechariah said, you know, the word of the Lord came to Zerubbabel and said, not by my might, not by might, not, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You know, we cannot accomplish anything apart from God's spirit. Um, David, you know, in, in the Psalms said, some trust in chariots, some, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. You know, being God-centered, God-focused um, is so critical uh, in in what we do, because we cannot c- accomplish spiritual work without God without God's spiritual resources, and uh, and so 
Um, you know, a couple things. I, I live in Chicago, and I think there's some people that operate, and I've operated but like this in my life, you know, when, when I've been spiritually fatigued and, and, uh, and wrestling with all those roadblocks. I kind of, you know, sometimes we operate under what I call Blues Brothers theology. You know, Jake at Elwood said they, they were on a mission from God, you know, and, you know, have you ever, have you ever said, I'm doing, I'm doing this for God? You know, and, and I, I've, I've heard myself say that, you know, over the years. And, and I've heard others say that, you know, we're doing this for God. You know, that, that is really, you know, it tends to be, you know, egocentric. You know, it's, it's we're not doing it for God. Uh, I think bi- biblical theology uh, talks about that we're, we're on mission with God that we work with him. You know, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You know, I hear people always say, well, you know, I see a lot of things accomplished. Well, you know what the bottom line is, that we can accomplish a lot of things in our flesh. But, you know, if we're not doing mission with God, we're not going to accomplish anything of rich spiritual significance. That's going to see lives and hearts transformed for eternity and uh, build things that last um, uh, last for the glory of God. You know, one of the things that a little tool that I used over the years with leaders is what I talk about, the, uh, and I learned it from a friend of mine, this working the wheel of relationships. And when we talk about our relate, you know, relationships with others, you know, there's there's this wheel. The wheel. There's two key components. It's talking and listening. Talking and listening. And uh, and and when we when we just meet each other, you know, we we talk and listen a little bit, and we're acquaintances. But when we deepen our relationships, is when we do it repeatedly over a long period of time. And and that's why when we when we when you think of your close friends and close buddies, uh, you know. That back in college and all the people you hung out with, you did a lot of time with them, and you did a lot of time talking and listening. You did it repeatedly over a, over a, a focused period of time, and that's why when you can, you know, 20 years later, uh, when, when you haven't talked to them in 10 years, you call them on the phone, you can catch up with them, and and, and it feels like you were just back 20 years ago. And so this whole idea of of this is the wheel of relationships of where we create intimacy. And and so how do we do that? You know, we do we do it in our marriages. We talk and listen and talk and listen, and we do it repeatedly. And 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 uh, but how, you know, how do we do that in our relationship with God? You know, it's it's by what praying, and by hearing His word, right? By hearing His hearing His word uh, and and listening listening to His voice in our lives. You know, I love this. I love uh, you know Revelation three twenty. Jesus said, "Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him, and he with me." And, you know that 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 verse when I was a brand new Christian meant so much to me that the God of the universe, <laughs> my Savior, you know, wants to sit down and have a meal with me. He wants that intimacy with me, and uh, and and. And that was very profound in my life, in, you know, individually. And uh, but then, you know, as I as I've grown and as I've, I've appreciated that text and understand the context of that text, he's you know, it's really talking to a church. He's really calling a church together to to what to have that intimacy with God to to, to have have a have a meal with Him as a as a community of believers. And so, how do how do we do that as a community? I mean, so you can apply this this wheel of relationships into into your small groups, into your teams, into your meetings. And so how do you as a how do you as a team talk and listen to God and how do you do that repeatedly? You know, one of the saddest things I hear as I as I work for churches is you know, work with churches, um, is you know, where where they they never open the Bible during a board meeting. They never pray for each other during a board meeting. You know, and 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 it's this whole idea of it's it's like we're we're we're, we're you know doing ministry apart from Jesus, and Jesus calls us to do ministry with Him, and uh, and so working working that relationship, being being God centered is a, is a critical critical dynamic, and also being gospel driven. What does that mean? What does it mean to be gospel driven? Well, it means it means it means that the gospel of Jesus is not only the means of our salvation. 
You know, it's the power of God for, for salvation, but it's also the fuel for our Christian life and, and, uh, and, and our focus and mission. I love, you know, I've been really focusing in the, on, the, the, on Paul's letter to Titus over the last few years. And there, there are two just rich gospel-centered passages uh, in that in that little epistle, and and the first one the first one in, in chapter two is really calling the church to you know the, the, to to live out to live out the gospel, um, and and it's the fuel of our Christian life. It's the, it's the motivation for our behavior and the power for our our sanctification, and 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 then then we see in chapter three where he's really challenging. Uh, he's really encouraging Titus to remind the people who live on the, the the believers who live on the island of Crete. He's really challenging them uh, to to live out the gospel, to live out the gospel missionally uh, in their community. And and he and he he's got this beautiful gospel-centered passage in there because it becomes the not only the the fuel but the fuel of our Christian life, but also the focus of our mission. And so one of the questions you got to ask yourself as a leader. You know, are you are you experiencing a growing awareness and dependence of the gospel uh, in your life, and, uh, and and that's the that's the challenge. You know, how are you how are you playing out the gospel in in your life and in your soul? Because it is the you know it is the it is the power. You know, it's the power of God into salvation. It's it's the and, you know, and God's salvation is not only does He save us what from our sins, but He saves us you know, from the power of sin, and 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 one day we will we will be saved from the presence of sin. And so, the whole sanctifying nature of the gospel in the leader's life is so important. Gary, here's a yep. great question from the chat area: sure. Why is it so easy for us to take our focus off being gospel-centered and gospel-driven? Yeah. Well, I think we number one we live in a <laughs> we live in in uh, uh, the enemy's territory, and I think there's a, you know there's a spiritual warfare di- dynamic to it. And there is our own flesh, our own our own weaknesses, and uh, and and I think that's why we're we're exhorted over and over again in Scripture uh, to be growing in the grace of God um, and uh, to understand who we are in Christ and understand. Uh, who we serve and whose mission we're on, and uh, uh, you know, I think that's just it's just an ongoing battle that that we live and, and we fight every day. Mm-hmm. Right on, right on. Thanks. All right. R is uh, results oriented. You know, and and here's the thing: what does what does Jesus want us to aim at? You know, when we think about results, you know, I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna grow, you know, you're gonna grow personally and you're gonna grow. Uh, those around you, and you're going to grow your organization. Um, you know, you've got to have a, a results orientation, and and so, but you want those results to be really lined up with the Word of God. And so, what you know, what does Jesus want us to aim at? That's what I, that's the question I'm always asking. And uh, and basically, you know, we see this in the Great Commission. We see His marching orders. And uh, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And so Jesus wants us to be about disciple-making. He wants us to be about making disciples uh, for his honor, for his glory. Um, and, and so as we, as, we, as we think about that, these are some of the things that, some of the things that we, we need to, to measure. And, uh, you know, I always say it's, you know, you're going to lean on one side or the other side, you know, reaching or teaching, okay? And, uh, and, and we see this, if we can go back to this slide, you know, we see baptizing is, is the reaching and teaching, you know, is, is really training, you know, that, that teaching to obey. I don't know about you, but, but training is harder than just teaching content. And, uh, and I think what Jesus is talking here about is, is, is training disciples to obey everything that he's commanded and uh, and that's that's messy training people is messy we've got this uh, little dog that my uh, two-year-old dog that my wife got uh, uh, we we had a 14 year old uh, lab for you know for 14 years and you know a lab's a real man's dog you know now I've got this little terrier or terror I call it um, and it's uh, <laughs> It's a, uh, it's really a terror, and uh, uh, it's this lap dog, and it's a, it's a female, and so it's got little pink bows, and it's not, you know, and so I, I've got to walk this dog every day, and, 
it's uh, really a struggle for me anyway. But we're we decided that we wanted to train this dog, and 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 it's um it's amazing. Um, my wife decided she goes, you know, our our old dog, we we never trained him how to, um, you know, tell us that he needed to go outside and do his business. And uh, she goes, well, I want to I want to really train our 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 dog this way. So she's got bells on the front door and back door of our house. And so this little dog, her name is Maggie, you know, she rings the bell and then, you know, someone takes her out and she does her business and then we bring her back in. Well, you know, this dog, it's just training's messy. That's all all I can tell you. Training's messy. Sometimes that dog rings the bell just to get attention. Sometimes that dog makes a mess and then rings the bell. I mean, it's just training people is messy. And, uh, and so, you know, disciple making is messy. It's not only reaching them, but training them in the gospel, training them to obey everything that Jesus is believed. And and what happens in some churches is some churches get on this this whole idea of reaching and teaching. And I like to use the the analogy of an airplane here because it's it's not you know it, it's not either or, but it's both and. You know, it, and. And what happens is, you know, you, you maybe have a ministry that's all about reaching, you know, and seeing people come to Christ. Well, you know, that's one wing of the airplane. And then you have the teaching wing of the airplane. And the key here is, is I think you've got to have some kind of balance here because what happens is that if you're just a, if you're just a teaching church and you're not reaching anybody, you're going to spin around in circles. If you're just a reaching church and you're not really teaching and developing, you're just going to spin around in circles. And and I think the key thing here is to ba- be balanced as you make as you as you progress. Um, and so always thinking about you know how am I how are we reaching people and then seeing them what transformed and conformed in the image of Christ and 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 obeying his com- and obeying his commands. And so I think that's really a, a critical critical area in, in wrestling with that tension of. Uh, reaching and teaching and trying to keep that plane flying, you know, longer and farther um, and, and making progress instead of what, just going around in circles, going around in circles. You know, there's some churches that are just teaching churches. They're just teaching churches and they, and they think they're, they think they're deep yet. They're probably really, you know, they tend to sometimes get really muddy and get stuck. <laughs> And then there's reaching churches that I think they're reaching and reaching and reaching, and and you know what? They become very vulnerable. And I've seen I've seen churches that have had lots of conversion growth, you know, uh, baptized two, three hundred people, and um, because they didn't have a solid teaching training program, disintegrated, you know, and there's nothing nothing left. They're not they're not they don't even exist today. So that you've got to be balanced uh, in, in your approach as you as you look at the, as you look at being results oriented. How are you making disciples, maturing them, uh, reaching them, and maturing them in the name of Jesus? I like this. Uh, here's some just some questions to ponder. <clears throat> you know, uh, the whole idea of more and better disciples. Where where are your visitors coming from? You know, are they just coming from your marketing programs? Are they coming from the relationships, the connections that people are making. You know, what's a healthy annual baptism rate? You know, if you're if you're really reaching people, one of the things that we keep championing around our churches, the churches we work with, is uh, uh, in our newer churches we have a higher baptism rate. But you know, as churches get older and mature, we really are really championing and, and saying that we think a 10 percent a baptism rate is really, really, really critical. And uh, in the sense, if you're running 400 people on a Sunday morning, you should be baptizing, you know, 400 adults on an annual on an annual basis. Uh, where are your people serving? Are they just serving in the church? Or are they serving in the community? You know, uh, who are your people mentoring? Are you creating that that environment where there's mentoring relationships, where there's community, and where there's there are people pouring into other people's lives? You know uh, what? What evidence is there of 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 a spirit of generosity? You know where people people are growing in their in their giving and growing in the in the the use of their resources uh, for God's work. You know, is there a, is there a, a deepening uh, dependence of the gospel in people's lives? You know, are, is are, are they are they Understanding the the sanctifying work of the gospel in, in 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 their lives, and then where are your leaders coming from? 
are your leaders coming from the harvest or are they coming from the the church down the street you know are you are you really making more and better disciples these are some questions just to think think through the as you as you aim aim at what Jesus wants you to do and and get better at it Gary, can I ask you to go back to the healthy annual baptism rate we've went in the yeah. chat area um, w- walk us through that one more time yeah um, typically you know we would you know where people are um, uh, in our in our movement, uh, we pa- we practice believers baptism, and so one of the things that we're challenging our people on an ongoing basis, our churches on an ongoing basis, is that we think that a healthy baptism rate, in in a sense where they're seeing uh, adult converts come to Christ and be baptized as followers of Jesus, uh, we believe that you know if you've got an average attendance of 400 individuals on Sunday morning that it's healthy to expect that you will have, you know, 10% um, of those uh, of that those attendees would, would be um, uh, people that have come to faith in Christ and, and have been baptized. So it would be 40 adults. So if you're running 400 attendants, you know, you want to aim at about 40 adult baptisms uh, throughout the year. All right. All right, thanks. And that, that was a helpful clarification. I do appreciate it. All right, great. Oh, it's outreach focused. You know, just if you're going to grow your organization, the, the one one of the things is you've got to evangelize first. You know, I sat in a room with a, a number of leaders, and all of them had smaller churches. All of them had churches all under a hundred. And I sat in I sat in this room, and I I basically said to every one of them, I said, gentlemen, you know, we're here. Uh, I'm, I'm basically telling you, you are not going to grow your church churches. Unless the only way you're going to grow your churches is through evangelism, and uh, and and you're going to grow it through the people you reach, and uh, and and the friends they reach, and and because the the, the whole idea is, I said, you know, none of none of you have the bells and whistles to compete with all the large churches and large ministries around you, and so the only way you're really going to grow is by what reaching people with the gospel and getting into their webs webs of relationships. Um, and so we've got to be outreach focused if we're going to see growth, if we're going to break growth barriers. Okay. And so you know, Jesus said, you know, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields; they're ripe for harvest. And so, how do you how do you open your eyes to the harvest and and the opportunities all around you? There's a little tool we've used over the years called the Harvest Exercise. You know, in your target area area. You know, compare compare worship attendance to population. You know, one of the things that that we've we've done with uh, new church planters and and even other churches uh, to really examine the harvest within their ministry field is is it just kind of maybe maybe they even just don't even have to call people and ask them what their worship attendance is, um, but they just I, I understand how many seats, how many you know, how many people could actually go to church on Sunday. You know, and if you multiplied that by two, you would see, um, um, you know, be, you'd be very interested in in, in the, the number. Would be very interested, very interesting. Um, compare um, compare your, uh, um, you know, wor- again the worship capacity of your community uh, to uh, uh, to the population. When we do these exercises uh, over and over again, it's just amazing how underchurched all the communities are. Um, in a number of cases, we'll, we will we'll do a study and we'll see that 50% of the people couldn't go to church if they if they wanted to. If every church was full, if two service, two or three services, um, you know, 50% of the community couldn't go to church, um, and so we are we are vastly underchurched in our community. What's the capacity of your facility? You know, what's, you know, how many, you know, can you, what's the maximum capacity uh, of your facility? And we're really big on, and on, on just encouraging people to, to use the facilities that they have to the max. Um, you know, two, three, four services. Um, you know, a variety of services in different, different, on different locations. Even, even renting the facility to other churches just to maximize this tool, because buildings are just tools. They're evangelistic tools, 
uh, that uh, need to be used and maximized. And then, you know, what's the maximum capacity of your missionary force? You know, who are you turning into missionaries? You know, are you are you are you bringing people into the life of your church to serve the church, or are you bringing people into the life of life of your church through the life of your church to what serve and reach the community? Uh, you know, we used to we use this word assimilation all the time um, back in the 80s and 90s, and I think the new word now is mobilization. We're not to assimilate people into the life of the church; we are what to mobilize people into God's mission. And so everything we do on everything we do in the, in, through our church is really to mobilize this missionary force. So what what is the maximum capacity? You know, if you have 400 people on Sunday morning, you know, do you have a 400 person missionary force? You know, and so work, working that through. Um, three questions to ask. You know, when you think about outreach, and and you know, who who are you trying to impress? You know, what will impress these people? And how are you leading your church to open their eyes to the harvest? You know, you know, if you're if you're just trying to impress Christians, that's who you'll impress. If you're trying to reach people who are far from God, um, you know, you know, what's it going to take to reach them? What's it going to take to touch their hearts with the, with the gospel? And then, how are you leading your church to open their eyes? How are you leading your church to to uh, uh, see their neighbor, see their friend, see their coworker? Uh, you know, what are you doing to raise the spiritual temperature, you know, in your church, um, and uh, and create that 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 uh, that need and that desire and that call, that call that sense of urgency uh, to outreach. One of the things that I talk about with pastors is you know learning how to helping them put themselves in the path of mission. And you know, one of the, I think one, what happens so often with pastors is that we can get so our time and energy can get so eaten up by just working with the church, working with God's people. And uh, and one of the things that I'm I'm a big proponent of is encouraging pastors to think about themselves as not only just pastors of their church, but pastors of the community, and investing their time in the community. And so I'll work with church boards and and uh, help one, and we help them find pastors and and I'll, I'll even I'll kind of set the stage and I'll say you know your pastor needs to be spending 20 percent of his time in the community serving the community so that he can rub shoulders with community leaders and work within civic groups and service organizations and and be around you know what receptive God fears and 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 so that so that his life is going to be refreshed evangelistically and, and set the example. Uh, for the church, and so, so how do you, you know, what are you doing to be in that path of mission? What are you doing to be in the, in the redemptive flow of God that's taking place in your community? And how do you position yourself? You know, I've, I've talked to many, many pastors, coaching them, and one of the exercises I do is I do, I just ask them, well, tell me about your work week. Tell me about, you know. Um, what you're, what you're, who you're meeting with during the week, and it always amazes me how much of their time is just, you know, all their meetings are with Christians, you know, just all their meetings are with Christians, and 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 and, and instead of what spending time outside the church, investing uh, in in with investing in their community and investing in those relationships. So you've got to, you know, I think this is a way to open your own eyes as a leader to the harvest. Okay, Gary, you're getting some pushback here about assimilation okay. versus mobilization. Uh, okay. What if it's a two-sided coin where assimilating into the work of the church is a part of the mobilization process? Um, now talk about talk about how they how those two ideas might be linked a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I I, I think the you know it's all about the end product. You know, yes, you're gonna you're they're gonna assimilate into the life of the church. But the goal, you know, I think one of the things that happened out of the church growth movement of the 80s and 90s is that we talked about assimilating people into the life of the church for the church. And, I, you know, and so um, and what happened is, is that people just got, you know, began serving in the church. And, and I think now um, we've said, yeah, we want to assimilate them into the life of the church, 
but not just not the the goal isn't for the church the goal is for the mission and uh and so we want to you know move them through um uh you know uh, you know that's part of your assimilation i always say assimilation is really spiritual formation and discipleship uh, and and so the end product isn't to make them a good servant in the church but to make them a missionary in 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 their world yeah, I think another another way to push on that is Bill Hybels is always saying the local church is the hope of the world, and mm-hmm. folks that push back on him say, well, yeah, Jesus working through the local church is the hope of the world. And it's it's it's, it's a both and kind of situation. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, your your spiritual formation process in the life of your church is not just to benefit the church, but to benefit what the the community and. Uh, um, and so, you know, I remember people coming into our <clears throat> the church that we started, and and we we kept pushing this idea. We want you, we we want you to be out in your community. We want you to be serving in the community. Uh, and people would come, you know, man, I came to Christ, and my whole life was focused around the church. You know, this is all new to me. Now you want me to move out of the church into the community? And, uh, and I said, yeah, because. You know, we're all we're all missionaries. You know, we're all missionaries on mission uh, with God, and uh, and so so it's all it's all the end product. I think what we're looking at. So, all right, W. Keep we'll keep moving on time here. Uh, work on leadership skills. You know, and so again, this whole idea that uh, you know, if the axe is dull and the edge unsharpened, more strength is needed, but skill will bring success. Warren Bennis and Bert Nannis say, uh, it is the capacity to develop and improve their skills that distinguishes leaders from followers. You know, and I think this is critical in our lives. And so, as you, as we think through the the sharpening of our edges, you know, one of the things we need to do is we I, I encourage pastors to do a one year growth plan. And so, so they can maybe maybe you could even use this category of skills. And say, you know, what what do I what do I want to hone in on this year? Uh, I I had one one gentleman <clears throat> who I led to Christ who was uh, um, older than me, and he worked in uh, HR and and did a lot of coaching and and stuff like that, and 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 he spent a whole year with me just working on the art of delegation. You know, delegation is a, is a fine art <laughs> that you that you have to work at and develop that skill. To really delegate properly, that uh, that would and that, that the type of delegation that empowers a person to achieve the results that you want them to to achieve, and so I spent a whole year just focused reading on it, working with him, coaching me through different scenarios, and just practicing it over and over and over again uh, until that until that skill was honed and, de- and developed more. And so, you know, what what skills are you working on? What skills are you, do you need to sharpen up this year for your own personal growth, for your team's growth, and for the for the for the growth of your organization? So those are uh, so how do you, how do you work on those skills and and, de- and develop them? Um, you know John Maxwell in his book Developing Leaders Around he talks about the attraction principle and he said a person in lead, in, in a leadership position who is a five on the scale of one to ten will attract. Uh, will not attract a leader who's a nine. Why? Because leaders naturally size up any crowd and migrate to other leaders who are at the same level or higher. And so, if you're going to attract stronger leaders around you, you need to be growing as a leader. You know, growing pastors attract growing leaders, and uh, and and tip, and and our growing churches. And then T, take responsibility take responsibility um, you know uh, we have different gifts according to the grace given to us if it's leadership let him govern diligently you know one of the, one of the issues that uh, if we're going to grow our organization to a new level we're going to grow ourselves grow our team grow our organization uh, we, we there's a sense of responsibility for its growth you know so if you're going to grow as a leader you've got to take responsibility on your own life to grow, to grow yourself. If you're going to grow your team, you've got to take responsibility to do that. If you're going to grow your organization, you as a, that's what leaders do. Leaders take responsibility. And uh, 
I love this, uh, you know, saw this movie years ago, um, The Bug's Life, and the first rule of leadership is everything's your fault, you know. <laughs> Just love what that, love that quote. And the whole idea is that, is that, you know, you're the leader, and the leaders take responsibility. Uh, three reasons why leaders shy away from responsibility. One, fear of failure. You know, what if I don't make that goal? What if I don't achieve? What if I don't grow my grow the organization? And so they 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 they, they have that fear of failure. Uh, they're inadequately trained. They don't understand that that's their responsibility, or they don't know how to grow the organization. Uh, and then another one is just unsure of God's call is is the third reason why um, why leaders shy away from taking responsibility for the growth of their organization. And then uh, lastly, it's H is having a con- having a, a contagious enthusiasm. You know, enthusiasm really means being possessed by God or having God within or being inspired by God and. And uh, Paul, you know, in his letter to, to, to the Ephesians, talks about being filled with the Spirit and, and speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and make music in your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ um, for everything in the name of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so this having a, this this is I think deals with our attitude, you know, and and how do we you know. How do we keep our keep our head in the game sometimes? You know, ministry, it's a battle. It's a battle and how do we how do we keep our head in the game to to be enthusiastic, to be joyful, to be inspiring, right? Um and uh there's just a couple couple things, just a couple thoughts here. Number one, I think we need to realize that there's a real enemy seeking to devour you and your church. You know. There's an enemy out there that wants to discourage you, to distract you, to derail you, and, and ultimately he wants to disqualify every minister for the gospel. And, uh, and he wants to, he wants to destroy, destroy the church. And there's a real battleground there, a spiritual battleground. I think we need to learn how to play out the gospel in our own lives. I love what Tim Keller says. He talks about the whole idea of of uh, you know, sometimes we need to practice the gospel, play out the gospel as a as a as a as a musician, you know, just practices their instrument. And so playing out the gospel in our own lives and understanding, you know, who we are in Christ and what Christ has accomplished for us and all the spiritual blessings we have in Christ. You know, I was thinking about this the other day, just reading reading Ephesians one, you know, it says every you know, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. I mean, the whole idea that that everything that God has to offer us, we have. We have it in Christ. And how do we play that out in our lives to strengthen our spirit, to uh, to uh, strengthen our resolve, and uh, to give us courage to move on, um, move on in our lives? The other thing is to, to trust God's sovereignty in our circumstances. You know we're gonna, we're going to fail. We're going to make mistakes, and 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 how do we you know do we trust God uh, in that? And in Romans you know eight twenty eight it, it talks about God working out all things you know for his for his good right, and uh, and and it's not only it's interesting that that verse talks about he doesn't work it out for everybody. He only works it out for those who love him, and in every difficulty. We have a choice. We have a choice to run towards God or to run away from Him. And bottom line is, we'll never understand and see God's sovereignty if we're running away from Him. We'll never see the good of it. And yet, if we love Him and we run towards Him, He'll make sense of uh, whatever whatever circumstances we're, we're dealing with in our lives. Uh, live by faith, not by sight. You know, that's just... That's our mantra. You know, that's how you keep your head in the, keep your head in the game and just remember the mission. Remember the mission. I just thought about this the other day. Just how many times you go through Paul's Paul's letters and you go through the Book of Acts and you see how many times Paul refers back to his calling, refers back to the fact that God called him to be a, to, to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And 
uh, and and he's always referring that he's re- in that sense he's remembering the mission. He's remembering the higher purpose of his life. Uh, that God has called him to be a part of this. Carl George said this one said this one described enthusiasm like this. It is to have a quality of life that causes people to sparkle in their eyes with interest to what you're all about. You know, when we are filled with God, when we are filled with God, that's a contagious enthusiasm. That's what enthusiasm means, being filled with God, being possessed by God. Uh, it just causes people uh, to wonder what we're all about. All right, well, let's put it all together here. You know, God-centered, gospel-driven, uh, results-oriented, outreach-focused, work on leadership skills, take responsibility, have contagious enthusiasm. All right, we take some questions. All right, we've got a couple here in the uh, in the chat area that have come in and said, you know what, my church needs work in all of those areas. Where should I start? What's your best advice for getting started? Well, number one, I think we need to work on ourselves, right? We need to, we need to is he talking about the, the, all those areas? You mean the, the, uh, mm-hmm. the, the team's edge? The <laughs> yep. okay. Well, I think number one, we need to, we need to work on our, we, we need to work on our own self, you know, cause it's just, you know, speed of the speed of the leader, speed of the team. And, mm-hmm. uh, and then, and then, and then we just work on that, that, the, the people around us, and you know Henry Blackaby talks about this whole idea that being thoroughly reached with the gospel. You know, one person being thoroughly reached with the gospel, when the gospel is that transfer, transforming effect in their lives, cities can be reached. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so not always trying to tackle everything at once, but you know what? Sometimes it's just one life at a time. Right, it's your life, and then start building your team and getting people around you. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely. If uh, a small group of fully committed people can make an amazing amount of impact, that's for sure. That's right, that's right. Now, building on on what you just said, Gary, starting with yourself, Linda is asking, how do I specifically develop better leadership skills? What's what's your best advice for gaining competency? Mm-hmm. Well, I think, you know, I, I, I've always, you know, if you, um, you know, it, it, a lot of it is just, you know, doing it, right, and mm-hmm. uh, practicing it, and, and I think that's one, one thing is just getting out there and, and, and lead, um, whether it's delegation, learn how to delegate, you know, it's like it'll take you, you know, Fifty times to delegate a task to somebody <laughs> for you to for you to get better at it, um, and I think I think getting people around you um, and getting coaches uh, mm-hmm. speaking your life to help you with that, finding models uh, of people um, that can that can show you how things are done and uh, uh, watch them, watch how they. Um, Interact with people. Watch how they. If we're talking about delegation as a skill, you know, watch how they delegate. Uh, ask them how they do it. Ask them what are the keys for that. And then, you know, just again practicing it in your own life with people, and um, and just watching it over and over again. So. Yeah, there, and there's lots of good assessments also out there for leadership skills. Sometimes it does require you get your mind around exactly what the. Uh, what the assessment measures, but sometimes a, an objective assessment can be a helpful tool for for that process as well. And that's one of the things that CoachNet does if you visit CoachNet. Yep, objective assessments, 360s, you know, um, having other people, how they experience you, you know, because sometimes we do things out of our awareness. Mm-hmm. You know, and we need to, it needs to be brought into our awareness so we can correct it. Yeah. So, yeah. Let's, let's build on another comment from me here. Uh, Stephen is asking, just how important is a coaching network or some kind of network relationship in leadership growth? Oh, it's 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 vital. It's critical. Uh, what other word can I use? <laughs> uh, 
you you really need to be around people who are leading and growing, mm-hmm. you know, growing organizations. I mean, there is, um, you know, there uh, there's nothing there's nothing like it. When when I did an internship in in a in a church years ago, um, the first church that I, I did an internship in, uh, the church didn't really grow at all, and uh, and I really you know. Didn't really learn that much there. I learned, I learned, like I always told you, I learned how not to grow a church. <laughs> uh, but then when I went and did an internship at a, at another church where the church just grew dramatically, um, it, you know, grew from 40 people to 300, and then up to 700, uh, and people were coming to faith in Christ and were building disciples and all those things. Well, that that just changed my whole attitude. It, and it, it increased my faith. And, uh, and 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 gave me the courage to go out and, and do it my, do it myself. And so, you know, being in a in an environment where uh, things are happening, where you're seeing growth take place, where you're seeing uh, lives being transformed, uh, really, it 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 increases your faith. And really, mm-hmm. that's we live by faith, not by sight. And uh, and I think that's a that's a critical piece. And so, you want to be in those environments that increases your faith. That uh, um, you, know, you can believe the impossibilities and and and, and the, that these impossibilities can become possible uh, through the grace and the power of God. Yeah, I, I, what, is, what is the old saying? You become the people that you're around, that you hang around with. You become like the people that you hang around with. I think there's a lot to be said for that. And I just want to point out that uh, the guy who runs the coaching organization is not the guy who endorsed the coaching network. Not that I wouldn't. But uh, it just so worked out in this conversation that Gary got to say the nice things about coaching. So uh, next question. For the small established church, how do we get beyond those people who are hindering growth? And how do we get beyond them without cutting our own throats? Right. Well, I think you, you know, one of the things that I, um, you know, encourage is, um, you know, when you start reaching people, you know, um, I, I think you, you it, it, that's the life change is going to help change your church. You know, when people start seeing lives transformed by the power of the gospel, that that can transform your church. Now, you know, so if, if people are going to, you know, hinder that or, you know, Kabosh it, and, and you know, I, I've, we've all heard the horror stories of where you know a lot of people came to Christ in the church, and the old guard said, "We're not going in this direction," and shut it down. I mean, that's just terrible. Um, and and I think you know part of it is just you know every you know like the the whole reaching and teaching uh, the, mm-hmm. the airplane analogy. You know, everybody would say every church would say we're here to reach and teach people. And it's all what they emphasize. Right, and so how do you how do you cast vision? We're going to talk about that. How do you cast vision to, to to people over and over again, and and get it back down to 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 lives being tra- transformed? I mean, every person in your church, and every, and even those people who oppose, maybe oppose you and oppose what's going on. Maybe maybe they oppose you, not the mission. As you got you got to kind of figure out sometimes. Is uh, maybe it's the way we're presenting it to them, um, or maybe it's not a way we're not including them in the process. Um, and so we've got to always think that through and how how we're del- delivering those things. But um, but you know everybody has a loved one who's far from Christ, mm-hmm. you know? and and they want them to know and experience what they have. Um, you know, so I I always appeal on on that level. But then, you know, sometimes you've got people who are unregenerate, you know, who are in leadership in the church, and, and then sometimes you've got to deal with that, you know, in, in a stronger way. So, mm-hmm. Paul, how about one? Decided. How about? Go ahead. How, how about one more? Okay. Um, this is the this is the coin of the realm, the, the sixty-four million dollar question here. When you talk about focusing on results, can you briefly define the target of Developing a healthy disciple. What does that disciple look like? Mm-hmm. Well, I kind of break it down <clears throat> into like six little areas. Okay, 
one, I want this. I want to see them craving intimacy with God. I want them to learn how to meet with God, to hear God's voice, to learn how to read God's word, to learn how to pray. Okay, so that that intimacy with God. Two, I want them to learn how to share their faith naturally, to tell their faith story in a natural way. Um, three, I want them to be mentoring, being mentored by somebody, so that they eventually could mentor somebody. You know, uh, I want to see generosity um, in their lives. I want them to understand that they're that God owns out everything they have, and that they're to be uh, generous with that and see that spirit of generosity. I want to see them serving, you know, serving in the church, serving in the community, serving others. Their lives marked by that. And then I want them to have a growing awareness of the gospel in their lives. And now, you know, we talk about the centrality of the gospel, with that growing awareness. So, so those six, six things, intimacy with God, sharing their faith, mentoring, uh, generosity, service, and then a deeper understanding of the gospel uh, in their lives which will be the foundation that uh, the theological foundation that they're going to be built on. So. All right. Very good. Very good. Well, some great stuff today, Gary, I think okay. lots of, right. uh, lots of good possibilities for, uh, for expo- exploration moving forward. And we definitely are looking forward to the remaining. I think there's 13 more episodes in this 14 unit uh, webinar series. Now, one of the outcomes of this particular webinar series is is to equip you to move through growth barriers. And if you're thinking about the value of coaching and the challenge of the growth barrier that uh, uh, that you have uh, begun to to that you see looming in front of you, what you see on your screen right now is what we call a storyboard, a barrier storyboard. And at CoachNet, we are rolling out a process to use an intentional coaching relationship with a roadmap like a storyboard. This is intended as a, as a fairly linear process that, that helps you anticipate the roadblocks that uh, you might see in front of you. So working with a coach, you would become more able to anticipate the challenges in front of you. So if that idea is interesting to you, this new coaching process is going to roll out in the, in the later portion of the fall uh, of this year. There are specific tools for each of the growth barriers, and the skills that Gary's walking through are the individual application of this corporate uh, tool. And there's one designed specifically for each of the significant growth growth barriers with uh, custom resources that move along. We would love to uh, to talk with you about that. If you're interested, visit coachnet.org slash barriers, and there's a, a place you can stick your name and phone number information in there, and we will follow up with you as these tools become available. Like I say, I anticipate that in the second half of fall, probably late October, early November, these will become fully available. So if that idea piques your interest, that's how to get a hold of that. And, of course, there's my contact information if you're looking for coaching or you want to explore some of these ideas that Gary put in front of you uh, during the last hour. So lots of good stuff to, uh, to work through and lots of opportunities to think about how you can apply it in your own life. Gary, do you have a final thought that you want to leave with us as we wrap up uh, this webinar series? Well, I'm, uh, you know, I'm excited about uh, you know, this and, and not only am I uh, excited you know, about uh, seeing what what God's going to do um, in and through people's lives as they as they take this challenge of kind of growing growing as a leader, um, but I'm really excited about you know the impact it's going to have on the kingdom mm. as uh, as we as we move forward here and to see churches uh, break barriers and uh, and when you break barriers you're reaching people with with the gospel and uh, and that's where that's where it comes all down to is just seeing that life transformed. Um, by the power of God and to see them impacting their relationships and their spheres uh, of friendships. And so um, that's really that's really the motivating factor behind what, what we're doing here. Right, very good. Well, thanks for a great hour. Can I wrap us up with a word of prayer? Great. All right. Lord God, we say thank you. We thank, say thank you for how you've spoken to Gary, your, uh, your, your disciple, and we say thank you how you've broken the world into pieces that we can get our minds around. We know that your ways are higher than our ways, and uh, we fall short of your glory. So thank you for speaking clearly to us uh, through Gary, and we ask you to help us with application now. Show us what to do next. Help us make the next faithful decision so that your kingdom comes and your will is done on earth as it is in heaven. All for your glory, Lord, all for your purposes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Amen. All right. God bless. Nice. Blessings, Gary. Thanks. Good. Thank you.